Very good afternoon to one and all gathered here for the day two of uh, orientation of our net training. And uh, we will be sh starting with our next session that is session three, it's people and environment. And it's my privilege to introduce the resource person for this uh, session. It is Dr. Callistus Jude, Dean of Sciences, Krista Jayanti College. Sir holds a PhD in human genetics and his areas of research is cancer genetics, genotoxic studies. Sir has more than 20 years of teaching experience and also he heads various other committees in the college and he's an active member of uh, all academic and extra cu uh, curricular activities in the uh, college. So we are very happy to have you amongst us, sir. Sir will be dealing the topic people and environment so I request participants to kindly uh, mute your video and audio till the end of the session and you can discuss with sir at the end of the session. Hand over the session to you, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Sonia, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, okay. So my audio is fine? Yes, sir. Yes, All right. So thank, uh, thank you, Sonia, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear participants. Uh, so today we will be discussing um, on uh, the third uh, topic uh, in the as part of the net set training of uh, paper one which is uh, people and environment and i welcome you to the second day sessions uh, to be held today uh, so this uh, topic people and environment is uh, very interesting as well as a very important topic uh, in the present context uh, because uh, you know like uh, <clears throat> if you would have seen a a, a picture of the earth from uh, outer space if you have seen pictures of the earth from outer space uh, you know the earth appears uh, ex exquisite it looks brilliant uh, appears as a brilliant sphere with uh, you know lots of clouds around it uh, we know it's our home and we've always felt that it is inexhaustible we thought everything is available nothing is wrong but little do we realize that the earth is uh, fragile and vulnerable because it's climate Nowadays, you can hear a lot of news about it. Its climate is uh, dangerously altered. Its life support systems, which provide food, uh, water, and oxygen, clean water and oxygen, are being destroyed at a record pace. And it's dooming thousands of species into extinction. And it is threatening our well being also. So, how did we end up in such a precarious situation? So, if we, could, uh, if we have a glimpse on the, uh, of the uh, human cultural evolution, we'll get an answer to this. Uh, if we briefly survey uh, several million years of our life on Earth, uh, it will provide important insights into the environment crisis we face today. And uh, in today's session, we will uh, take you through, we will journey through very briefly on very important aspects, the important aspects, concepts and terminologies uh, connected to uh, our env environment, environmental concerns. And uh, I have uh, titled this uh, talk as a changing relationship with the environment because, uh, you know, um, uh, if we look, uh, look behind, uh, we, our relationship with the environment has been changing. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the cause for uh, the, uh, the uh, problems of the environment that we face today. So before we go directly into the topics of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, people and environment, uh, Yeah, uh, a little uh, about how uh, man evolved and, uh, you know, how uh, the different cultural, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, cultural evolution 
has resulted in uh, damage to the environment. We will see a brief, uh, we'll have a br brief overview. As we all know, we, uh, we say that we have evolved from uh, uh, the apes, all right? So uh, all of you would be uh, recollecting the name Australopithecus, as you can see here. Uh, we thought that we evolved from uh, these, uh, you know, first uh, human-like primates called as Australopithecus, which uh, uh, lived in this earth three million years ago. But actually, these Australopithecus uh, evolved from uh, small uh, insect-eating mammals, which you can see here on the right. Uh, so we almost uh, we have evolved from these kinds of creatures. Okay, so uh, insect-eating mammals like the tree shrew that we see today. And there are also reports saying that we have uh, actually evolved the uh, proper human uh, form evolved from uh, a species called as Sahelanthropus candensis, uh, as you can see the picture here. So this is the exact ancestor of man, they say, which existed 7 million years ago in uh, the Sahara region, which gave rise to the uh, you know, modern man, Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, uh, we came into existence in this uh, earth four, uh, you know, uh, uh, 4 million years ago, four, 400 million years ago. Uh, now, uh, uh, after the evolution of man, uh, uh, you know, the uh, most important uh, developmental significance is the ability of man to uh, take to uh, bipedal locomotion. So apes and uh, monkeys had quadrupedal locomotion, but then uh, with the evolution of man, uh, the type of evolution, uh, type of, uh, you know, the posture became straight and the man started to free his forelimbs and just walk on his hind limbs. So this, uh, these hands, because they were not put into use for walking, uh, it improved over time through, natural, through a process called natural selection. And, and uh, this conferred manual dexterity, the flexibility for the hands, the movement of the hands in different ways. And this helped man to prepare or manufacture tools, simple tools and weapons to hunt and also to manipulate objects. And uh, this was not, only, uh, not the only developmental change, but then the brain size of man also increased. There was, because of this, there was increased eye and uh, hand coordination, and this helped in uh, making better tools and you know, manipulate the environment and shape the environment. And this later on led to the technological development. Uh, uh, so uh, earlier the uh, man wa was, uh, the society you know, of uh, human beings was hunters and gatherers. They, you know, they just hunted the animals and they gathered what was available and they lived on it. There, uh, this society had a very good knowledge of the environment. They didn't disturb the environment. They understood how environment uh, was important to them and they had a deep reverence for the environment. So the tools that they used, they could make was uh, sticks, stones and bones. With these tools, they could hunt the animals and provide for their living. So the technology was very primitive and here the population was under control because there was not much of a surplus and there was no need uh, for uh, a man to be greedy and uh, also that when he had uh, settled in different places he used to move from one place to another he led a nomadic life and so the damage that was created to the environment was very less and if at all it was created the damage was easily repaired and this uh, uh, hunting and gathering uh, uh, kind of a society they, it changed over uh, to an agricultural society in the period uh, 10,000 and uh, to 6,000 BC uh, and uh, a man, you know, flourished in rainforests of Southeast Asia. There he practiced agriculture. So the society became an agricultural society. He started uh, cultivating plants and, uh, uh, you know, he used to uh, adopt the slash and burn agriculture wherein he used to clear some area of the forest and then he used to grow the crops and use the crops for his living. And he used to domesticate animals and uh, uh, also they devised the plow, which was useful in agriculture. Later on, he used the oxen to, uh, you know, plow, plow the fields and this increased the productivity and then he could, uh, uh, you know, produce more and more crops. And because of the surplus, there was also swelling of the human population and there was, uh, you know, a kind of a change wherein man started moving to villages and cities and uh, he uh, adopted, uh, uh, apart from agriculture, he used to, uh, he uh, entered into the, uh, the, uh, the profession of craft and small-scale manufacturing. Um, and uh, at this time, there was increased demand for environmental resources like wood, metal, and stone. And so this led to even more exploitation of these resources. And also there was, a, a, you know, compared to the hunters and gatherers, there was, a, there was a poor land management 
uh, man didn't care so much for the environment and uh, it led to the destruction of the nat uh, natural environment. Also that because he was, uh, you know, domesticating animals, there was overgrazing, excessive cu cutting of timber, and he adopted a very poor agricultural pra practice. And this led to loss of fertile areas. This led to barren land being created. And this eventually led to uh, perishing of certain civilizations. Then um, in the 1700s, the industrial revolution started. So man, the society came to be called as an industrial society because uh, you know, uh, with the advent of coal, uh, he man could you know uh, uh, start off industries, and with these industries he could manufacture machines and tools. So there were new technologies, and there was abundant supply of fuel, uh, and also there was a product demand. So there is there was more of influx of uh, fuel, influx of food. There was a demand for food. There was influx of food, minerals, timber into cities. And uh, because of all these activities, the industrial activities, there was increased production of smoke, ash, and a lot of wastes. Of course, there was increased agricultural production because uh, uh, in, in agriculture, a lot of machinery was used, mechanization of agricultural processes. There was use of fertilizers and also man adopted the plant breeding techniques, which improved the productivity. And uh, uh, newer medicines were being uh, uh, discovered and there were better sanitary con uh, conditions. Because of this, uh, it, uh, all these uh, processes enhanced the survival of man. He lived for a longer time and there was a decline in the death rate. And this led to increase in the human population. And at this uh, period, again, there were a few people who realized the importance of nature. Few people were in contact with nature. And the city, they found that city life became advantageous. And here man uh, started to take control over nature. There was increased population. There was again demand for resources, and here uh, the pollution started increasing, and also there was environmental destruction. So this altered the human environment interaction. So you see that this period was very crucial, where we uh, started changing our relationship with the environment. So with that background, uh, we will go into the topics one by one. So first. Uh, uh, we will talk about pollution. So to define pollution, you will see in uh, many of the uh, sources, uh, simply to be defined, the pollution can be called as an undesirable change in the physical or chemical or biological characteristics of either air, land, or water that harmfully affect the human life or any other life, any desirable species, the living conditions of uh, life, and also cultural assets is called pollution. Um, so moving into the first type of of pollution, which is air pollution. Uh, we know that air comprises of many gases, of which nitrogen forms the major part. 78% of air is nitrogen. After nitrogen comes oxygen, which is 21%. And then you have a lot of inert uh, gases like argon, neon, krypton, helium, xenon, which are non reactive gases, which form about 1%. And you have uh, the carbon dioxide, which, uh, which uh, contributes about which is present uh, to a percentage of 0.03%, very less. So this is the composition of air. So when coming to uh, air pollution, there are two different sources of air pollution. So generally pollution itself is, uh, the sources of pollution itself is generally, generally classified into two types, which is natural and anthropogenic. We know what natural is, but anthropogenic refers to an activity by man. So any pollution that uh, is a result of activity by man is called as anthropogenic. The source is anthropogenic. So natural uh, pollution, um, air pollution arises from volcanic eruptions, dust storms, uh, forest fires, uh, pollutants from plants like pollen grain and soil, dust. And uh, you see that uh, uh, when a vol volcano or a dust storm happens, the amount of uh, pollutant that is created, forest fires, if you see the amount of pollutant that is created is very much. But however, uh, because uh, these um, events are infrequent, volcanic, volcanic eruption does not occur continuously. So they are, they are infrequent events. And also the events are widely dispersed at different places. So this is much, more, um, much less dangerous than the next type of pollution, which is anthropogenic man-made pollution because man-made pollution is concentrated in one place and it happens continuously. It is a frequent event and always it is happening in the same place. So this is more dangerous when compared to natural pollution. Anthropogenic pollution arises from 
uh, air pollution arises from uh, uh, the uh, exhaust from uh, automobiles, power plants, and factories. Uh, and we know that, uh, as I said, there are increased amount of pollutants in a restricted areas in one particular area. And uh, the uh, kind of uh, anthropogenic sources arise from three, uh, um, three you know, sources. Uh, one can be due to uh, vaporization of uh, components. Um, a second type can be because of attrition or friction. So some particles may be elaborated because of friction and that may that those particles may come into the environment calling, causing air pollution. And the third one is combustion. All right, so evaporation or vaporization, attrition and combustion are three anthropogenic sources uh, or nature of anthropogenic sources of pollution. Uh, so combustion is the uh, is far uh, 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 is by more the far, uh, the uh, important form of anthropogenic source because it causes a lot of damage to the environment. So combustion means uh, you know uh, it's a process of a process by which the fossil fuels are burned and energy is released to operate uh, you know um, engines. So what happens during combustion is that uh, the uh, fossil fuels are burned and fossil fuels are made up of uh, two important uh, molecules called carbon and hydrogen. So repeated, uh, uh, you know, um, carbon and hydrogen occur repeatedly and they are bound by bonds, as you can see here in this uh, illustration. And uh, during combustion, uh, if there is a small ignition, in the beginning, that ignition breaks uh, the initial bonds and releases the carbon and hydrogen and also produces heat and energy. And uh, this initial uh, uh, you know, breaking of bonds powers the uh, ignition for the next set of reactions. And like a chain reaction, the bonds are broken uh, and then the uh, heat and energy are released. All right, so this is what happens in the uh, engines uh, to release energy for powering the engines. Uh, but what usually happens is that the combustion is not complete. So always there is incomplete combustion and that results in the production of pollutants. So the major pollutants that uh, arise because of incomplete combustion are carbon dioxide, CO2, carbon monoxide, and unburned hydrocarbons. So these are all coming out of automobile and industrial exhaust. Along with these gases, uh, there also uh, comes the heavy metal contaminants like lead and mercury, because in fossil fuels, these, uh, uh, these elements are also present. So lead and mercury also come out as pollutants. And uh, when coal is burnt, it contains sulfur. So sulfur, uh, it reacts with oxygen. So whenever there is a combustion, the oxygen also is involved. And because of the involvement of oxygen, there's a reaction and production of new compounds. So here in coal, there is sulfur that is present. So when coal is burnt, oxygen attract, it interacts with oxygen and it produces uh, sulfur oxide, sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide, SO2 and SO3, sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. So these are again, another component of air pollution because of combustion of fossil fuels. Um, uh, nitrogen, uh, nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide are also components because uh, again, nitrogen is also present in air. So because during combustion, air is being used. So along with oxygen, nitrogen also is present. So when nitrogen reacts with oxygen, it produces nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide. This also emanates as a pollutant in the atmosphere. So these are all direct products of uh, combustion or the uh, I mean, the raw material, the fossil fuel, uh, the air or water, then they may react with other components that are present in the medium and they will result in the production of secondary pollutants. For example, now sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide, which is uh, you know uh, coming out because of burning of uh, coal, uh, it will react with uh, uh, oxygen and water that is present in the atmosphere and this will result in the production of sulfuric acid all right, so this is one of the examples of uh, the effect of uh, secondary pollutants. Uh, so coming to the effects of air pollution. So we are clear about the uh, types of air pollutants. Okay, so we have, uh, uh, we have the hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, lead, mercury, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxide. So these are all the pollutants that are present in air in addition to sulfuric acid that may result as a secondary pollutant, a reaction producing secondary pollutant. 
Now coming to the effects of air pollution, first we will see the environmental effects. Uh, so well, most of the time we would have observed uh, uh, the kind of uh, you know kind of uh, 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 scene that you see in the pictures on on the right of the slide, a grey coloured uh, haze and a brown coloured haze. We would have witnessed this. Okay, now uh, this haze is because of the presence of pollutants in the uh, air. All right, and whenever these pollutants, in case of a uh, in in case of a city or a place which is very cold, it has a cold climate and moist air. So there, and also because of the presence of uh, certain industries, there is uh, emanation of sulfur oxides and particulates. Particulates are small dust-like particles, which may be of different sizes, which cause different effects in the environment as well as in living beings. So sulfur oxides and particulates may emanate from factories and they will react with moisture, they will combine with moisture, and they will appear as a gray haze over the uh, cities. Okay, so this, uh, these cities which exhibit this kind of a haze over the buildings is called as a gray air city. And this haze is appropriately called as the smog. Smoke plus fog is called as smog. Okay, so the name smog was given. Um, and when you look at the picture below this, the one in the bottom, you have a brown colored haze over cities. This uh, happens in highly industrialized areas cities where the climate is not cold, the climate is warm. Uh, so here the uh, uh, source of pollutants in these kind of cities may be from automobiles and electric power plants and many other modern industries. So the kind of pollutants would be carbon monoxide, obviously from automobile exhaust, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, nitrogen oxides. So these, uh, and also there will be unburnt hydrocarbons, okay, unburnt hydro HC is hydrocarbon. So unburnt hydrocarbons, Again, they will uh, 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 react with the nitrogen oxides present in the air. And in the presence of sunlight, it results in the uh, uh, production of ozone, another uh, uh, gas that is present in the atmosphere. So this results in the production of ozone. And another important pollutant called as peroxyl acyl nitrate. Peroxyl acyl nitrate, in short called PAN. All right. So these uh, uh, primary pollutants, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, nitrogen oxides, then ozone, peroxyacetyl uh, acyl nitrate, all these combine and they give a brown colored haze over cities. Okay, so this happens in hot, uh, in cities where the weather is hot and uh, the kind of pollutants are these coming from automobiles and power plants. Okay, so it gives a brownish orange colored shroud and it is called as a brown air city. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we see the effect of uh, air pollution or pollutants on uh, plants and animals. We know that the pollutants are extremely harmful to either plants or animals. Ozone that is present because of uh, this, uh, this reaction, uh, as I told you, in this reaction, there is involvement of sunlight. So it is called as a photochemical reaction, which results in the production of ozone and peroxyacyl nitrate. So here, ozone is uh, present in the atmosphere at a greater extent, if at all, because of pollutants, ozone levels are increased. Then ozone makes the plants more brittle. Okay, plants are not stable; they break away easily in, I mean, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, very uh, mild wind. Uh, also, it can break. And uh, sulfur dioxide, when it is so too, is sulfur dioxide. So when sulfur dioxide is present in the atmosphere as a pollutant, it will cause spotting of leaves. Okay, so the leaves will have spots and uh, discoloration of the leaves will be there and because of that photosynthesis will be affected. So these are some of the important uh, effects of uh, uh, air pollution on plants. And uh, the picture which you see down below is that uh, of an organism called as a lichen. Lichen or lichen, any way you can pronounce it. So this uh, lichen is a uh, combination, it is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. So two different forms of life, fungi and algae. So these two combine and live together and they are called as lichens. You would have seen them grow in many places. As you can see here, they are growing on a rock. So these are very resilient organisms. They can grow in any type of a place uh, because they derive their nutrition and energy and uh, you know whatever they need uh, from the atmosphere, from the rain, from the, uh, from the atmosphere, they derive all the nutrients. So these uh, lichens are considered as uh, indicator species because they will indicate whether pollution is there or not because they derive nutrients from the atmosphere and in case there are pollutants in the atmosphere it will cause the destruction of lichens 
so if you see lichens in a place uh, in this year and after five years uh, you see that they have disappeared that means that place there is a lot of pollutants and so the lichens did not survive so we can call them as an indicator species for pollution uh, as you can see here this table shows the different effects that uh, air pollutants have on different materials okay so you can see here that it has an effect on metals on stone and concrete on paint on rubber on leather on paper on clothes and on ceramics and you can see on the right side which are the pollutants that cause these effects uh, coming to the uh, effect of air pollutants on humans uh, two types of effects can be seen one is the immediate health effect immediately when you are exposed to pollutant in few hours or few days you will experience something wrong with your uh, physiological system okay so the, those are called as immediate health effects or acute effects so here you see that the immediate health effects are shortness of breath eye irritation and sometimes it may also lead to death the short time exposure uh, might uh, result in death also depending on the kind of pollutants and how your body is reacting to that pollutant and uh, sometimes when you are in uh, amidst uh, heavy traffic you might have experienced a headache sometimes we consider that headache as because of as a result of stress at work or some other uh, reason but then it may be because of the increased carbon monoxide levels because you are amidst the heavy traffic and there is a lot of automobile exhaust that is coming out and as i said automobile exhaust contains carbon monoxide and this will cause headache okay co is carbon monoxide co2 is carbon dioxide the third one sulfur dioxide if it is present in the atmosphere as a pollutant it will result in the um, uh, in in cold cough and rhinitis it is called um, runny nose uh, inflammation of the uh, nasal area and ozone if it is present it irritates the respiratory system if ozone is there then it will irritate the respiratory system it will result in sneezing and uh, different kinds of allergic reactions so those are the immediate health effects the chronic effects chronic effects appear when there is long term exposure to the pollutants okay so here if you are exposed to sulfur dioxide or uh, ni uh, nitrogen dioxide or ozone for a long period of time it results in conditions called as chronic bronchitis and emphysema okay so these are all respiratory disorders chronic respiratory disorders chronic bronchitis refers to the inflammation of the bronchi which is the windpipe all right so uh, uh, the windpipe that leads to the uh, lungs so the inflammation over there will result in the increased secretion of mucus and also blockage of the airway so that breathing will become difficult emphysema is another respiratory condition wherein the uh, the alveoli you might have heard of alveoli you no know, inside the lungs there are small sacs called as the air sacs where the exchange of gases happen all right so those air sacs uh, are becoming damaged because of pollutants all right so that is called that condition is called as emphysema so this will result and bronchial asthma and lung cancer are other chronic effects of air pollutants so you see how harmful they will they are when we talk about uh, air pollution uh, we cannot miss uh, you know talking about ozone all right so um, uh, in the previous slides we saw ozone as a pollutant causing a lot of uh, ill effects that's because in certain areas the levels of ozone increase and it causes health effects in humans but at the same time ozone is a gas that is required to block uv radiation from reaching the earth we are all aware of it so about 98% of the uv radiation is blocked and screened by ozone gas and this ozone uh, here the formula uh, uh, chemical formula for ozone is o3 all right so ozone Uh, this is present in uh, in the layer of atmosphere called as the stratosphere as you can see here in the left side uh, you see the picture there all right so you uh, very close to the earth is the troposphere all right so this uh, spans to about 20 kilometers and from 20 kilometers above the earth to about 45 50 kilometers is the stratosphere so in the inner layer of the stratosphere probably from 15 to 45 kilometers uh, the ozone is present and this ozone prevents the ultraviolet rays from hitting the earth all right because these ultraviolet ultraviolet radiation are harmful to uh, human and other uh, living beings uh, now uh, if the ozone layer is going to deplete then what are the problems and what are the causes 
of ozone layer depletion. That is what we're going to see in this slide. So here, uh, in the 1950s, uh, there was an important uh, product that was developed, and it was called as Freon. Freon, as you can see here. This was used as a propellant. There are two forms of Freons, Freon 11 and Freon 12. Freon 11, uh, technically called as trichloromonofluoromethane. As you can see in the formula here, uh, the formula, chemical formula, trichloro means three chloride uh, you know, uh, um, uh, molecules are there and one fluoro, so monofluoro and methane, CH is methane. So this is the chemical formula. And then the Freon 12 is dichloro, difluoromethane. So these two were called as Freons and they had a very important uh, uh, you know, application. They were used, uh, the Freon 11 was used as a propellant in spray cans, paint sprays. All right, so it, used, it was used as a propellant to spray the paint. It was a very important uh, industrial uh, you know, uh, innovation. And the Freon 12 is uh, used as a, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in the uh, refrigerators in, and air conditioners. All right, so these two are very important products. And uh, these fall under the class of uh, co uh, chemical compounds called chlorofluorocarbons, in short, CFCs. Okay, so CFCs uh, include freons. Uh, the types of freons are freon 11 and freon 12. Uh, it's not necessary that you should remember the chemical name. It's quite uh, complicated. Uh, so uh, it was thought in 1950s that uh, this was a very important innovation and uh, the chlorofluorocarbons uh, did not have any effect, harmful effect in the atmosphere. They just diffused in the atmosphere and never caused any um, you know, uh, ill effects. Uh, but then in 1970s, someone proposed that uh, uh, it might cause an effect and it was found that it causes an effect because uh, these freons, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, in the atmosphere, when they interact with sunlight, in the presence of sunlight, they are broken down, okay, and the chloride ions, chlorine atoms are liberated, okay, so chlorine atoms are liberated, and this uh, reaction is called as photo dissociation, okay, photo dissociation, because, because in the presence of light, sunlight, the molecule uh, dissociates, liberating the chlorine ions, uh, chlorine atoms. So it's called photo dissociation. Now what happens, the chloride, chlorine atoms which are free now are called as chlorine free radicals. All right, so they are very highly reactive. So in the atmosphere, they go and react with ozone. All right, and they destroy it. So they one, uh, one molecule of uh, chlorine, it will go and bombard or react with uh, one molecule of ozone, uh, liberating oxygen and one uh, O, uh, one molecule of O. And then uh, that's why the ozone O3 is broken. All right, so ozone is destroyed. All right, so it's shown here that one molecule of chlorine atom can destroy one, uh, one lakh molecules of ozone. So imagine the effect. All right, so along with the uh, uh, freons, the other uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, components that actually destroy ozone are carbon tetrachloride, which is used in fire extinguishers, and also nitric oxide from uh, jets that fly at a high altitude. So these, uh, uh, you know, um, this equipment and the jets, they will also liberate, liberate chemical components which destroy ozone. All right, now ozone is destroyed and depleted and what are the effects? So increase, when there is less of ozone, then there is increased amount of UV rays that strike on the earth. This results in skin burns, cataracts, skin cancer, premature aging, immunosuppression we become more prone to diseases all right so we don't have that immunity to fight the disease so this results when we are uh, when a lot of uh, uv rays uh, uh, you know are, uh, impinge on the earth and we are affected by it and uv rays is lethal to plants uh, in you know non fatal doses cause uh, damage to the leaves it causes inhibition of photosynthesis and it may cause mutation in plants that means a genetic alteration in the plant and also causes stunted growth in plants. And there is reduction in the phytoplankton population. Now, in the water bodies, uh, uh, the phytoplanktons are present. So these are photosynthetic microorganisms that are present in the water bodies, all right? So they are food for the uh, fishes, okay? So if there is a reduction in the phytoplankton because of the uh, you know, UV rays striking on them, then uh, the uh, food will be depleted for the other organisms. Ultimately, there will be uh, you know, uh, uh, 
in decrease in the numbers of organisms in that particular uh, water body uh, so one percent depletion in ozone leads to 0.7 to 2 percent increase in uv light striking the earth okay so this is the effect it causes so this is how ozone protects our earth another important concept when we talk about air pollution which we can't miss out is greenhouse effect and global warming all right so to explain this concept you can see the pictures here so on the left uh, is what uh, actually happens in uh, in an uh, in an atmosphere which does not have air pollutants so uh, the um, uh, radiation from the sun reaches the earth all right and most of it is reflected some is reflected from the uh, water soil vegetation and uh, from dust and some is reflected from the clouds all right but still some uh, percentage uh, reaches the earth and it is absorbed by air the land uh, and uh, when it is absorbed it is converted to heat all right and uh, this heat over a period of this day over the period of the day it is uh, being radiated back into the atmosphere okay uh, so this is how the earth is kept warm all right and uh, there is also uh, the presence of these gases in the atmosphere all right so if they are present in levels below where they are considered as pollutants they are important they are required they are necessary so in the atmosphere there is carbon dioxide there is nitrogen dioxide there is methane all right if so if water vapor is there so all these components what happens what they do is that they will again reflect back the heat which is radiated from the earth again back to the earth all right so if their levels are normal if their levels are less then less heat is again radiated back to the earth all right and this is this keeps the earth warm or maintains the temperature of the earth so imagine if carbon dioxide or nitrogen dioxide or methane is becoming more in the atmosphere if their levels increase as pollutants then more of heat is reflected back to the earth all right so this leads to heating of the surface of the earth this leads to increased temperature all right so this is called as greenhouse effect all right so if you have seen a glass house if you would have entered a glass house uh, you would have experienced that uh, the the glass house is warmer than the outside all right so because of the presence of these gases carbon uh, carbon dioxide nitrogen dioxide methane okay uh, uh, the earth is uh, you know um, assuming that of a uh, glass house the earth is kept warm all right but when the gases increase in concentration then more of heat is retained in the earth surface and this leads to global warming all right so that is uh, greenhouse uh, effect and global warming i hope you understood the concept uh, and because of the increase in uh, you know these gases and because of this uh, greenhouse effect and because of global warming what happens is that uh, uh, there is increased global temperature all right and uh, so this increased global temperature will warm the oceans okay so when um, there's more of temperature when the surface of the earth is very warm and the oceans also become warm then this decreases the solubility of carbon dioxide all right now uh, the water bodies especially the sea is a great reservoir for carbon dioxide so carbon dioxide when it is present in the atmosphere it is quite dangerous it is only required for plants okay uh, uh, so they will be used by plants other than that they are very dangerous so the carbon dioxide is reserved in the water bodies all right so if at all the water body becomes warm then there is less solubility of carbon dioxide and so carbon dioxide is liberated again into the atmosphere so the levels of carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere so this is kind of a feedback positive feedback one increases and then the next event also increases all right so here again uh, with that carbon dioxide there is more of deforestation so there is more of carbon dioxide available in the atmosphere because forests are cut down and uh, uh, carbon dioxide is not being absorbed by trees and burning of fossil fuel also leads to uh, increased amounts of carbon dioxide so there is increased levels of carbon dioxide because of all these activities in the atmosphere and this causes the greenhouse effect all right and uh, because of that uh, greenhouse effect there's more of global warming global warming also results in melting of glaciers and polar ice caps because of that the reflective surface uh, you know these uh, glaciers and polar ice caps Uh, function as reflective surfaces reflecting the radiation back to the atmosphere but then 
because of loss of these uh, glaciers and polar ice caps, the, uh, the reflective surface decreases and so that increases the temperature of the earth. And this results also results because of melting of polar ice caps. It results in uh, rising of sea level and flooding of coastal areas. So there's a lot of effect because of the uh, increased amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So um, we would have thought that pollutants are only present in the air outside. But then in the places where we live inside the house or inside any building, there are a lot of pollutants and there are they are even more dangerous because, you know, we are uh, most of the time we keep ourselves closed in the house and we are exposed to these pollutants inside the house. Uh, so some of these pollutants are carbon monoxide. You know, these, uh, these pollutants, carbon monoxide, particulates, I told you these are very minute uh, uh, solid particles which range from, uh, you know, uh, a uh, few microns to 100 microns in size, very, very small, all right? And uh, depending on the size of uh, these particulates, uh, uh, we can say that they are inhalable. Some of the particulates which are quite large, uh, you know, in size uh, from 50 to 100 microns, let's say, they can be inhaled and they remain in the uh, upper respiratory tract. And certain particulates which are smaller, even more smaller in size, may have access. When we inhale them, they will go deeper into the respiratory tract and they will go to the bronchi. And even more smaller particulate matter increase, they measure about five to 10 micron. And uh, they might, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are called as respirable uh, 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 particulate matter. And they have the ability to uh, cross through the alveoli, which I was talking about, air sacs, where gas exchange happens, where the blood meets the uh, gases. So in the, in the gas which we inhale, if such a particulate matter is present, which is so small as five to 10 micron, then it can pass through the walls of the air sac and it can enter the bloodstream. All right, so it's so dangerous. Uh, then sulfur and nitrogen dioxide. So these are all present in, uh, you know, uh, tobacco smoke, if there are smokers in the house, uh, stoves in which we burn fossil fuel, heating systems. From all these, these are the sources of all these pollutants. And uh, soil and building material and stone that we use to build the house. Uh, uh, it liberates a gas, important uh, poisonous gas called as radon. All right, and you can see what it causes. It causes lung cancer. And uh, formaldehyde is a chemical that is found in furniture, plywood, wood paneling. Okay, and this will cause irritation of the eyes, nose, throat, and it may also cause lung cancer. All right, and asbestos, which is present as a insulation around the pipes, or we might have asbestos sheet on the roof, and this uh, actually, you know, uh, causes lung cancer. Okay, so these are all the pollutants that are present indoors and these are the different effects it causes. So we have come to the end of air pollution, the pollutants and their effects. Moving on to water pollution. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, the surface and groundwater. So when we talk about water, water is present in the earth in, uh, in two uh, forms. It is present on the surface of the earth in lakes, rivers, uh, ponds, and uh, see, and it is also present beneath the ground, and that is called as groundwater. Okay, so in uh, in the uh, beneath the ground, there are water tables or aquifers. We call them aquifers in which the water is stored. Okay, and when we drill bore wells, uh, that is that water is what we take out. And uh, the sources again, like uh, air pollution, the sources of air pollution are two. Uh, one is natural, anthropogenic. We know what these mean. And when we talk about water pollution, there is also a term called as cross-media contamination because the pollutants that are present in one medium, for example, if a pollutant is an air pollutant present in air, uh, it may be washed down to, wa uh, to water bodies because of rain, all right? For example, uh, probably sulfur dioxide is present in the air and when it rains, uh, it forms sulfur, sulfuric acid and it might come down uh, to the earth, okay? And it might contaminate the water bodies. So this is called as cross-media contamination, all right? So moving uh, of pollutants from one medium to another. Um, so when talking about sources of water pollution, we saw there are two sources, natural and anthropogenic. And uh, anthropogenic sources, when we further classify them, they are classified into point sources. That means uh, the source of water pollution is at a particular place, at a particular point, okay? So these are discrete locations. They are easy to identify and control, all right, because they are discrete positions. So these point sources are seen in factories because the factories have uh, effluent uh, discharge pipe that is a source. Okay, power plants, mines, oil wells, 
sewage treatment plants these are all these all have a outlet and this is a point source we can identify that and in case if it is required we need to control the second type is a non point source where you are not able to identify where the source of pollutant is from all right for example in farms there may be uh, pesticides that may be sprayed all right so this is sprayed over a wide area and it will enter the water bodies from different places okay and forests streets urban streets because oil spillage will be there in case of a parking lot oil spills and then this oil is uh, washed by rain and it enters the water body uh, so these are all the different non point uh, sources and from these sources you get different types of pollutants dust sediment pesticides asbestos fertilizers heavy metals salts oil grease uh, air pollutants uh, that are washed by rain cross media contamination also happens so in this non -po non point sources the sources are many and they are spread out so it is difficult to control and uh, you uh, we all are aware that uh, many of the industries in india and many other countries are always uh, located near water bodies near rivers and uh, the effluents that are coming from the uh, these industries usually pollute the, the major rivers uh, so india is no exception uh, so coming to the uh, nature of pollutants water pollutants there are about five types uh, so first class are organic nutrients all right so they arise from living matter so they called as organic nutrients and they called as nutrients because they nourish other life okay so sometimes the waste one waste will become a nutrient for another organism okay so this is what happens here so in developed countries uh, the kind of organic uh, uh, organic nutrients uh, come from these sources from feed lots okay where livestock are kept and they are fed a lot of waste so sorry uh, to interrupt uh, yeah there's one person requesting to go to the previous slide so can you go on the previous slide that's a request yes this one ma'am yeah. i think that only me sir okay thank you sir so here we were talking about the different rivers major rivers in india uh, uh, you know uh, in the banks of which the major industries different industries are located and these industries are source of water pollution because the effluents directly go into the rivers can i move over ma'am okay so we were talking about the uh, organic nutrients so in developed countries uh, these are the source of organic uh, uh, nutrients as pollutants uh, you will have feed lots uh, where the poultry or it's a it may be a piggery or it may be a place where the livestock are reared so there the uh, feed is given and a lot of feed goes as a waste it's a feed lot and then there may be sewage treatment plants uh, which will uh, generate a lot of organic nutrients as pollutants and the paper mills because you know they use pulp and then that's organic matter and it goes as a uh, along with the effluent so these are the sources in developed countries whereas in developing countries the major source is the uh, uh, you know human animal waste and raw sewage most of the time it goes untreated right so it may be a fecal waste uh, from humans and animals and also raw sewage that is released into the water bodies so these are the sources in uh, developing countries what are the uh, effects of these organic uh, nutrients uh, so these organic as i said these are nutrients so it's consumed by another organism so here when it enters the water body it is consumed by bacteria all right so there are specific bacteria present in water bodies which uh, uh, you know feed on these nutrients and uh, convert them uh, into harmless forms and uh, this purifies the water it clears the water of the pollutant and it purifies the water this is a good thing as you can see in the uh, illustration below uh, uh, in this part there is the pollutant that enters and then here this is the action of the bacteria that happens but at the same time because of the presence of the pollutant um, the uh, 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 you know uh, uh, the bacterial activity increases all right and uh, because of the bacterial activity because it wants to degrade the pollutant uh, more of bacteria are there and they will consume oxygen that is present in the water this results in the depletion of water uh, uh, depletion of oxygen in that area all right so in the place where the pollution is let into the water uh, where the concentration is more there will be more of uh, concentration of the bacteria and these bacteria act upon the organic matter and for this action they need oxygen 
and because of the utilization of oxygen by these bacteria there is depletion of oxygen okay so that is called as the uh, biological oxygen demand and because the oxygen depletes the uh, life aquatic life also uh, is uh, wiped out okay so fish and worms whatever was there in that particular uh, you know uh, area of that uh, water body uh, will uh, die because oxygen is not present all right uh, uh, fortunately uh, you know as water flows it is being purified and then again the oxygen uh, levels increase and then the uh, aquatic life thrive but what happens usually is that uh, the uh, from a point source the uh, liberation of these organic uh, nutrient as a pollutant is continuous all right and so there is a great demand for the bacteria to perform its function and uh, because uh, there is also dearth of oxygen in the place oxygen is getting depleted so these bacteria cannot thrive there so these bacteria are replaced by another group of bacteria which can thrive and degrade this organic uh, matter in the absence of oxygen these are called as anaerobic bacteria so the aerobic bacteria are replaced by anaerobic bacteria okay and uh, these anaerobic bacteria act on the remaining organic matter all right and they will convert it in uh, i mean degrade it uh, the problem is that these anaerobic bacteria they will uh, uh, produce uh, gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide uh, which causes uh, kind of odor and taste and uh, in the fishes that consume this uh, the odor and taste will be there in these uh, aquatic organisms also all right so this is the concept of a biological i mean biochemical oxygen demand depletion of oxygen because the bacteria are acting on the organic matter uh the second class are inorganic nutrients okay so these uh, inorganic nutrients as pollutants they are coming from agricultural waste agricultural uh, practices okay because uh, inorganic fertilizers are being used the pesticides and the fertilizers and uh, these fertilizers contain phosphates and nitrates phosphates and nitrates these are the inorganic nutrients again they are called as nutrients because they serve as a nutrient or energy source for a group of living uh, uh, organisms and also laundry detergents uh, phosphates also come from laundry detergents also nitrate and nitric acid comes from atmosphere again here we are talking about cross media contamination and also animal waste they contain phosphates and nitrates animal waste also contain phosphates and nitrates and all of this will seep into groundwater and from the groundwater they will enter the rivers so the effect of these inorganic uh, nutrients is this okay so they contain nitrogen and phosphorus they are nutrients so these nutrients will promote the growth of another group of living organisms algae algae and also plants so in the water bodies these algae and plants will grow to a greater extent and they will fully cover the water bodies we would have seen in many water bodies that this happens and this phenomenon is called as eutrophication eutrophication okay because of increased uh, nutrients all right Uh, there is increased uh, amount of algae and plant growth in the water bodies all right so this is eutrophication and what happens if there is uh, uh, increased uh, you know algal and plant growth in water bodies it impairs the swimming fishes can't swim and if the water body is used for recreation purpose we cannot use it fishing is uh, uh, not possible navigation through the water body is not possible and most importantly the uh, plant material in algae will decay all right again the bacteria will act on the decaying matter it becomes an organic nutrient so the bacteria will act upon it again there will be depletion of oxygen it will lead to bio, uh, the biochemical oxygen demand all right and uh, this again the organic matter after this aerobic bacteria will be broken down by anaerobic bacteria and it will produce methane hydrogen sulfide so the same thing what happened in the previous case will happen here so this is the effect of inorganic nutrients on water bodies eutrophication and others then in water pollutants there is also uh, you know uh, in water there is also if at all a pollutant is there it can be an infectious agent also okay so in contaminated water we see bacteria viruses protozoans all right so uh, we have heard of uh, diseases uh, water borne diseases okay typhoid cholera uh, polio is transmitted by water and uh, uh, <clears throat> you know hepatitis uh, type of hepatitis called hepatitis a virus is actually present in contaminated water the source is water and uh, dysentery amoebic dysentery is caused because of the presence of presence of uh, uh, an amoeba amoeba uh, amoeba histolytica in the water 
okay so different uh, forms of these pathogens will also be infectious agents will also be present in polluted water this is because the water is untreated um, sewage is untreated there is presence of animal wastes in the fields and feed lots which are washed into the uh, you know water uh, into rivers and water bodies and also these uh, infectious agents arise from meat packing and tanning industries from animal industries that an handle animal uh, you know parts and all that Uh, so the problem is less in uh, developed countries and uh, more in develop, uh, developing countries uh, um, and indicators of pollution are you know uh, uh, in case you want to assess whether the pollutants these kind of infectious agents or the uh, water is polluted by fecal matter uh, there are indicators as we saw in the previous case in air pollution lichens were the indicators uh, here if there is polluted water if you can screen for certain microorganism certain bacteria it will tell you that this water is contaminated with sewage or animal waste examples of these indicator organisms are coliform bacteria escherichia coli as you can see here the pink ones and uh, also uh, another bacteria called as streptococci streptococcal bacteria these are present in feces and if at all the water body is uh, contaminated by feces then the numbers of these bacteria will be more so these are indicators then the uh, next class of water pollutants are toxic organic pollutants all right so there are uh, about 85000 different organic compounds that are used in industries all right as uh, raw material and as products uh, solvents pesticides cleaning agents all these are sources of these toxic organic pollutants the problem with these toxic organic pollutants are that they are non biodegradable in the previous cases we saw that bacteria act upon the organic pollutants and they are um uh, you know um uh, degraded but in this case they are non biodegradable that means they cannot be acted upon by bacteria or sometimes they are degradable but then they degrade, degrade very slowly by the time the effect is done so they persist in the ecosystem or right? they persist in the habitat and uh, whenever these uh, non biodegradable pollutants are present in the ecosystem they are directly or indirectly consumed by the uh, life all right so uh, uh, so probably when uh, uh, probably it is present in the uh, grass then the grass of the, the pollutant is present on the grass then the grasshopper feeds on the grass all right so the pollutant goes into the grasshopper all right and uh, it is not assimilated in the grasshopper because it is it cannot be biodegraded it is there in the tissue this grasshopper may be eaten by a, a mouse all right and then the pollutant goes to the mouse and then this mouse may be eaten by the snake the pollutant goes to the snake all right and since the larger organisms feed more uh, feed on uh, you know more of these smaller organisms the more of these pollutants get accumulated in the body of larger organisms okay so this process is called as biomagnification all right so when the pollutant or a chemical gets uh, magnified in a uh, system life system it is called as biomagnification so this happens in the food chain and in the food web and these uh, pollutants are also carcinogenic they cause cancer in humans and aquatic organisms and when they these pollutants they react with chlorine they also become carcinogenic because chlorine mostly is added in water to purify water so these pollutants they combine with chlorine to uh, they become carcinogens and also they uh, create an offensive taste and odor in the water as well as in the organisms in the water um, the next class are toxic inorganic pollutants all right Uh, so here it comprises of chemicals again metals acids and salts all right uh, so they are uh, these metals and acids and salt they come from industrial discharge urban runoff from parking lots or any uh, establishments sewage effluents and also from mining so these are the sources of these metals uh, one of the important uh, metals that causes a, that poses a health hazard is mercury it's a toxic inorganic pollutant mercury which may be present in water if it is present in water uh, it is uh, enacted up it is acted upon by again there are specific bacteria which act on mercury then uh, you know uh, change it into dimethyl mercury and methyl mercury dimethyl mercury gets it evaporates slowly from water bodies whereas methyl mercury gets sedimented and it uh, you know slowly it is released into the uh, water body and it is uh, eaten by you know uh, aquatic organisms and it gets accumulated in their tissue and it leads to biomagnification now what happens when uh, humans consume these uh, aquatic organisms then the uh, uh, 
uh, no mercury the toxic substance goes into our body and it causes a lot of health effects all right so one of the example of this effect of mercury is seen uh, was seen in japan in 1950s and there uh, people developed a disease called as minamata disease because it it happened in the minamata bay uh, this resulted in the numbness of the lips the tongues and uh, tongue and the limbs of these people they lost the control of the muscle it also led to neurological defects like deafness uh, blurring of vision and uh, mental derangement all right so about uh, 50 people were affected and uh, this was a uh, uh, important uh, disease at that time and uh, the source of this uh, mercury uh, is from you know vinyl chloride manufacturing plant which uh, you know manufactures plastic and uh, uses that to uh, you know uh, uh, <clears throat> manufacture toys of toys plastic toys and and it also comes from incinerators coal fired power plants research lab in hospitals then there are also nitrates which uh, pose as toxic inorganic pollutant it comes from animal waste from fertilizers it is converted to toxic nitrates in the human intestine so when nitrate nitrate goes into the human body in the intestine it is converted into a toxic product called as nitrate all right so this nitrate when it is absorbed into the blood stream it combines with hemoglobin so this hemoglobin is important for carrying oxygen but instead of oxygen the nitrate combines with it and forms meth hemoglobin and uh, this uh, reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood all right and so uh, we face a lot of problems human will face a lot of problems it is fatal and chlorine as i said is present in water it is also a toxic inorganic pollutant at uh, higher levels uh, so it uh, it is again a carcinogen and it may be toxic to fish and uh, those are the different types of pollutants in water all right so chemical pollutants organic pollutants all those are there and another aspect of water pollution is thermal pollution all right so um, you know if the temperature temperature of the water is altered it is called as thermal pollution this happens uh, near power plants oil refineries steel industries and industries which use water for cooling so these industries use the water from the water body for cooling they are piped into the industries they cool the machines and then the warm water is let back into the uh, natural bodies all right so uh, this affects a lot of uh, this affects the environment and the uh, species also so the different uh, effects you can see uh, it will lead to the in increase in the heat tolerant species and decrease in the heat intolerant species so there will be a total change in the life that is present in the water body all right so those species which can tolerate heat will survive and will flourish other species will diminish and it will decrease the dissolved oxygen content of water so warm water will decrease the dissolved oxygen content because of that oxygen depletion happens and life cannot survive in that area it increases the metabolic rate in aquatic organisms if there is warm water the metabolism is even more and so the more energy is utilized sudden changes in water temperature is called as thermal shock and this will lead to sudden death of aquatic organisms then fish spawning the laying of eggs the breeding of fish is disrupted because of warm warm you know unnaturally warm conditions and the migration of aquatic organisms is disrupted and it will affect the survival and early development and then that the, the uh, there is a disturbance in the development early de embryonic development of organisms so the, uh, the young ones may die or they will have malformed organs and uh, you know um, in the warm waters there is increased susceptibility to parasites the aquatic organism the fishes will be increasingly susceptible to parasites toxic substances and pathogens so they will acquire more disease so these are the effects of thermal pollution and of course uh, part of uh, water pollution are oil spills all right and because of oil spills you know uh, there are a lot of sources of oil spills you know from uh, oil rigs or transportation and uh, all those sources and the impact of uh, oil spills are that uh, you know uh, the oil spill will take a long time to recover 2 to 10 years and this oil will settle on beaches it will affect it will uh, you know affect the uh, locomotion of organisms the water birds will be affected their feathers will be covered by oil they cannot fly and uh, they cannot control the uh, they cannot protect themselves from cold the insulating property of the feathers will diminish so all these uh, effects are uh, effects result because of oil in water plastics nowadays is becoming a nuisance uh, uh, and uh, plastic pollution in water is a big nuisance um, 
mainly because of uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, people throwing uh, plastics in large amounts in water bodies uh, from ships they are thrown sometimes the fishing nets are uh, you know uh, damaged fishing nets are left in water and uh, the uh, the aquatic organisms get entangled in those nets and uh, it causes injury and uh, sometimes the uh, you know the uh, organisms sometimes are able to nibble the plastic uh, components and then because it is not uh, you know uh, assimilated it accumulates in the body and it causes many other effects coming to ground water pollution so all all this while we saw surface water pollution so ground water although it is present below the uh, you know earth surface uh, we think it's protected but then it can also become polluted uh, so the contaminants uh, the pollutants are uh, most the, most of the time the pollutants are tasteless and odorless so it's very difficult to detect the pollutants in ground water the kind of pollutants are uh, uh, you know chlorides nitrates heavy metals pesticides tea greasing agents petroleum products all these will seep into the ground and will be present in the water uh, and also uh, you know these low molecular weight organic compounds also seep inside and they are carcinogens and we are using this this water and we are sometimes we are consuming all these pollutants it will uh, it will lead sometimes you know these uh, pollutants will lead to miscarriages abortion low birth weight birth defects in people who consume it and uh, skin rashes eye irritation neurology problems are other effects of pollutants that are present in ground water and we consume it uh, and one uh, uh, you know um, uh, during the past decades a technique is being used a very uh, you know uh, uh, environment friendly technique is used to to uh, you know uh, decontaminate uh, the pollutants uh, wherein we use uh, certain microorganisms which can work on these pollutants and transform them into a less toxic or a non toxic form okay so this process wherein we use a microorganism a biological agent to convert a pollutant into a non hazardous form is called as bio remediation bio remediation all right so uh, we have talked about uh, to the pollution water and air pollution now we move on to the environmental issues local uh, national and global environmental issues i understand that many of the participants are not from bangalore but then you can uh, you know uh, 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 work out on and analyze in your locality uh, or in major cities uh, what are the uh, local uh, issues environmental issue all right so in bengaluru i am showing you just as an example these are the different environmental issues we have uh, the problem of water supply uh, and uh, um, you know inadequacy of uh, water and what the government is doing about it the municipal corporation is piping water from the major river kaveri and arkavadi and uh, the government's uh, you know the steps of the government uh, uh, to conserve water what are the regulations the state and uh, you know local regulations that are there to conserve water uh, so uh, it's mandatory that we have the rainwater harvest uh, facility for uh, houses and establishments that are built in an area of more than 2400 square feet okay and water recycling all, all these are measures taken by the government the second uh, issue environmental issue in bangalore uh, is uh, the problem of sewage uh, sewage and sewage treatment a uh, lot of uh, because of the increased population increased uh, uh, sewage is uh, being produced and uh, there are not enough uh, sewage treatment plants to convert the uh, toxic substances into harmless substances um, <clears throat> and the next uh, issue is the problem of uh, inadequate drains or blocked drains which causes a lot of flooding during uh, heavy rains uh, and uh, also encroachments of these drains and water bodies which cause a lot of environmental issues all right so because uh, during the rain because of encroachment we've heard in a lot of cities because of encroachment the uh, flooding of uh, those those areas happened because originally these encroachment the areas were actually lakes where the uh, water gets stored but when we encroach the land then the it's a natural process that the excess water comes into that land then the air quality is another issue in bangalore a lot of air pollutants and the quality of air uh, is a is a problem in certain areas in bangalore the uh, problem of solid waste management is also there um, and and in bangalore especially being the silicon city the uh, environmental issue of e waste 
e waste generation and how it is uh, uh, either recycled or being uh, uh, discarded in a sustainable manner uh, disposal in a sustainable manner is another concern traffic and transport is another big problem in cities major cities um, and the loss of uh, you know forests and uh, parks and tree cover in the city because in bangalore bangalore was uh, is known as the garden city and a lot of uh, uh, tree cover is being removed because uh, uh, because of a lot of developmental projects like the metro uh, metro and flyovers and all that so this may be happening in many cities also so this is another environmental issue um, another local environmental issue is the uh, health uh, because of uh, change of uh, climate and uh, you know uh, prominence of infectious agents because of the change in climate so these are some of the environmental issues local environmental issues so participants can uh, you know um, uh, uh, you know discuss and uh, um, analyze the different uh, environmental issues pertaining to their local uh, locality. Coming to national environmental issues in India, uh, here I want to show you that one of the reasons for environmental issues is the explosion in population. So according to uh, uh, statistic taken yesterday at uh, 1 o'clock, uh, the uh, population in India is 1.37 billion. 1.37 billion. All right. And uh, uh, there's a, I mean, it's uh, increasing in a very fast pace and it is causing a lot of, uh, it is a reason for, it is one of the reasons for environmental degradation and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, problem, uh, posing a problem for sustainable practices. Uh, so in India, the first environmental issue is the degradation of forest and agricultural land. All right. So in, uh, um, uh, in India, many of the forest land is, uh, because it's agricultural country, so the, most of the forest lands are, um, you know, uh, cleared to cultivate for cultivation for agriculture. So 60% of the cult cultivated land that has been used for agriculture um, is, uh, you know, degraded. No more agriculture is possible because there is soil erosion. Soil erosion has removed uh, uh, most of the important nutrient-rich soil, and uh, water logging is a problem, and salinity is a problem. So 60% is going to be a waste and soil erosion has resulted in annual loss of 4.7 to 12 billion tons of topsoil okay so why the soil erosion happens is because the forests and the crops are removed because of that the soil also gets removed because the forest the trees and the plants they will hold the uh, soil intact and prevent soil erosion um, so uh, six uh, six lakh 37 kilometers square kilometers of land in india consists of forests. Uh, it works up to 18% of India's geographic area. And uh, most of these forests, the larger percentage of forests are seen in Madhya Pradesh and in the Northeast states. Okay, and uh, the forests are being, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, trees are being cut uh, in uh, most of the forest areas because uh, they are harvested for fuel. And the wood, need for wood and expansion of agricultural land leads to the decrease in forest cover. So we lose loss, a lot of forest cover because of these two practices. And also industrial and motor vehicle pollution increases atmospheric temperature. We saw how it increases the temperature, global warming. And this results in a shift in the precipitation patterns. We are experiencing that now. All right. So the rains, uh, you know, rains are coming only in unexpected times. Okay. So that's a shift in the precipitation pattern. So that affects uh, agriculture and also, you know, survival of the forests. Uh, the second uh, environmental issue in India is air pollution. All right. Uh, uh, obviously, the number of vehicles are increasing in cities and everywhere. And uh, there's also, uh, you know, apart from the automobile exhaust, there is also dust that is emanating because the bad condition of the roads uh, in most of the cities. And uh, <clears throat> in, in big cities, you can see that there is a 2.3 times higher than the amount, the, you know, the pollutants are 2.3 times higher than the amount recommended by World Health Organization. All right? And because of the increase in the pollutants in the air, there are a lot of effects. One of the prominent effects which we all know is uh, what we saw uh, on Taj Mahal, the discoloration of the uh, you know, marble structure of Taj Mahal. The next uh, uh, issue in India is water pollution. Uh, here, the major problem is that uh, the lack of uh, sewage treatment plants. All right? So there's a lot of sewage that is generated but there are not enough sewage treatment plant 
to treat the sewage. All right, as you can see here, uh, out of 3,119 towns and cities, only 209, 209 cities have partial treatment facilities, not full, but partial treatment facilities. There is uh, 61,754 million liters per day, MLD, million liters per day, sewage generation all over India. Whereas the treatment capacity of the sewage is only 22,963 million liters per day. Okay, so 38,791 million liters per day uh, goes as an untreated sewage. Uh, there are 920 sewage treatment plants all over India. And also that uh, many cities are uh, uh, located near the river banks. All right. And uh, in these areas, the uh, sewage, uh, untreated sewage and also partially cremated bodies are dumped into the rivers. All right. And uh, these uh, pollutants and organic matter, they flow downstream and uh, downstream in another city, they are used for drinking, bathing and washing. All right. So this is the environmental issue. Then, of course, the uh, noise pollution is an environmental issue. All right. So uh, noise emanates from uh, different sources. Okay, uh, honking and uh, you know publicity campaigns by politicians and religion, uh, religious uh, uh, you know uh, gatherings. All right. So there was a verdict uh, by the government in 2005 to control noise pollution. So they have st set the standards for permissible noise levels in urban and rural areas. But how far these are being followed is a question. Land pollution is the next environmental issue. Land is polluted with pesticides, fertilizers, and corrosion. All right. So uh, there is also a lot of uh, radionuclides, you know, the isotopes like uranium, which is being used for nuclear power generation and uh, improper disposal of uh, these nuclear wastes. Okay. is poisoning uh, regions like Faridkot and Batinda districts. And uh, this led to, you know, people developing a lot of health uh, issues. All right. There's also arsenic, beryllium, boron, cadmium, chromium, all these uh, different elements, chemical components are all there in the soil causing pollution of land, okay? And uh, unknowingly, people may consume it and they will, it results in uh, lethal and sublethal effects. Uh, another concern, uh, next concern, environmental concern is the uh, biodiversity conservation. We know that India is again very rich in biodiversity. Uh, you know, you can see that uh, 7.6 of uh, all the mammalian species present in the world is in India, 12.6 of avian species, 6.2 reptiles, 6% uh, uh, plants, all these are found in India. So it is rich in biodiversity, but then this biodiversity is in, under threat because of human encroachment. Uh, we know that uh, many parks, national parks are, uh, you know, started, uh, India started establishing national parks to protect biodiversity ever since 1935. And there were many acts that were enacted to protect uh, wildlife and plants. Okay, Wildlife Protection Act and Project Tiger are uh, some of the examples. And uh, at present, there are 551 wildlife sanctuaries which uh, protect uh, the specific uh, uh, animals, 104 national parks and 18 biosphere reserves. So these are all protected areas where biodiversity is conserved. 551 wildlife sanctuaries, 104 national parks and 18 biosphere reserves. Moving on to global environmental issues. Okay, So uh, almost uh, the same uh, issues will be there uh, when considering the national and in, uh, in the global uh, uh, scenario. So here uh, the first uh, uh, global environmental issue is pollution. All right. So there is uh, air pollution and water pollution because of different uh, sources. Uh, mainly because of industrial effluents and uh, exhaust and automobile exhaust, oil spill, all right, burning of fossil fuel, all right. Fossil fuel is nothing but uh, the uh, oils and ga natural gas, okay. So petroleum uh, and all this is our, uh, our fossil fuels. Uh, then global warming is the next issue because of, uh, we saw what is the reason for global warming and this is the important issue, global issue. Overpopulation is the third important issue because of overpopulation, there is increased need of resources and uh, exploitation of resources. Natural resource depletion. This is uh, the fourth uh, important global environmental issue because there is increased fuel consumption, 
there is emission of greenhouse gases there is that which leads to global warming and climate change and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, fossil fuel that is required okay because there's a lot of demand and so there is more of extraction of this fossil fuel and other important natural resources as you can see here in the statistic uh, this much of uh, total resources are mined from earth okay as of yesterday waste disposal is another problem global environment problem because uh, uh, most of the time the uh, developed countries dump uh, the waste in developing on developing countries nuclear waste is another health hazard again we don't know whether uh, all the uh, uh, you know uh, countries are taking care to uh, judicially dispose the nuclear waste because it may cause a lot of health hazards plastic is being generated in large amounts and it's being uh, dumped in uh, water bodies and lands loss of biodiversity is again uh, global environmental issue as well um, because of human activity lot of species and habitats have become extinct now why this is important is because uh, the uh, species when it becomes one species when it becomes extinct it has an effect on an other species which has been dependent on the extinct species okay so it uh, results in the imbalance of a natural of many natural processes one example is uh, you know uh, pollination if a particular species is destroyed or extinct then supposing if it is it is important for pollinating then that process of pollination is stopped and it affects the flourish uh, the propagation of the species deforestation another global environmental issue many uh, you know forest cover is 30% of the land globally 30% of the land is covered with forests okay and it's uh, it is said that 18 million acres of forest land is destroyed every year it becomes an environmental concern acidification of oceans because uh, you know um, uh, more of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, leads to more of carbon dioxide moving into water bodies and acidifying these water bodies so in the uh, last 250 years the amount of carbon dioxide that is produced by humans has been increasing and it is projected that by 2100 150% increase of carbon dioxide will be there and this has a great impact on aquatic life other important global uh, environmental issues are what we have already seen ozone layer depletion acid rain water pollution another uh, uh, thing which we may not be familiar is urban sprawl this is an environmental issue when we see nowadays in uh, major cities there is expansion of these major big cities to the uh, urban areas okay so the neighboring uh, uh, villages and suburban and urban area i mean um, the rural areas are becoming cities and people in the cities are coming to occupy the rural areas this is called as urban sprawl people from the urban areas moving into the rural areas is called as urban sprawl because of this uh, you know there is also requirement of uh, establishment so the land and is degraded there is more of traffic and in that area which previously no environmental issue was there was less polluted now becomes more polluted there are more of environmental issues and health issues okay so this is the um, effect of urban sprawl then uh, next environmental issue global environmental issue is public health issue because you know in many areas there is contaminated water having a lot of pollutants infectious agents chemicals toxins all these cause a lot of health effects and uh, also because of high temperatures because there is global warming there is change of precipitation patterns there is high temperature and this is conducive for the spread of infectious diseases as you can see nowadays you know uh, uh, dengue and all these kind of uh, diseases are uh, increasing global next to global environmental issue is uh, genetic modification of food genetic engineering so here uh, we, we are uh, i hope you are all familiar what uh, what genetic engineering is uh, wherein uh, the uh, scientists the biologists genetic engineers they will uh, you know uh, take one uh, segment of a gene okay if they want to improve for example let us say um, a crop all right so here in this example you can see bt cotton you can see bt cotton uh bt refers to bacillus thuringiensis okay a bacterium uh, so this bacterium produces a particular uh, a toxin okay uh, which kills the insects so scientists thought that uh, uh, you know this particular gene that produces the toxin the bacteria can be isolated and 
and inserted into the plants. So they tried uh, uh, the cotton plant. They were uh, successful in isolating the gene from the bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, and inserting it into cotton plants. All right. And now the cotton plants express that gene. All right. That means they produce that toxin. So the insects could not feed, or the insects that fed on the plant, they will die. They died. Okay. So this is genetic engineering. So scientists now and many critics feel that uh, genetic engineering may lead to uh, transfer of allergenic and toxin genes. So along with the gene that we require to transfer, along with that uh, a small part of a toxin gene can also be transferred and this will lead to the production of toxins along with the, uh, you know, whatever uh, favorable product that we want the plant to produce. It might also produce the product of that toxin gene or an allergenic gene. So this is one of the concerns. All right, and another concern of genetically modified food is that during pollination, the uh, insects and the pollinators will transfer the pollen which carries that gene to another plant which does not require that gene. All right, so it may be transferred, that particular gene in the pollen may be transferred by that pollinator, like insect or you know, kind of bird or whatsoever, can be transferred to uh, weeds and wild relatives of the crop species. So this is another concern. So this is the danger of genetic engineering, the critics feel. All right, so that uh, takes us to the end of the global environmental issues. So the next topic that we are moving into is on uh, uh, energy resources. Uh, so we know that uh, energy resources are of two types, renewable and non-renewable. And the renewable, we have renewable are sources that we can, you know, uh, that get replenished. As we use, it gets replenished, but overviews will result in our exploitation will result in a dearth of those resources. So renewable resources are 16%. They are solar, wind, water, and biomass. Non-renewable are those resources which uh, are getting depleted. It cannot be replenished, okay? Or it's getting very re replenished very slowly, and uh, that is not effective at all. So examples of non-renewable resources are oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear power. Okay, then uh, forest is also a natural resource. Uh, because uh, you know a lot of products we get from uh, forests and these are the benefits of forests we know about this forests perform a lot of protective functions it prevents soil erosion as i said earlier it binds the solid particles prevents solid uh, soil erosion and because of the presence of forests the fertility of the soil is maintained and increased because the you know the leaves and whatever uh, uh, you know uh, parts of the tree or plant that fall on the soil is converted to humus and fertilizer and also it is a habitat to wildlife Forests have important productive functions. We get a lot of products from forests, timber, honey example, honey is an example, bamboo is an example, fruits and uh, fruits are an example. Forests also perform a lot of regulative functions, okay? Uh, because they, you know, uh, important regulatory functions are that they, uh, you know, um, uh, reduce the reflection of heat back to the atmosphere, all right? So they absorb the heat. And they also play a significant role in global carbon cycle because the carbon is consumed, uh, carbon dioxide is consumed by the uh, plants and uh, trees. So they reduce the amount of carbon dioxide present, present in the atmosphere and they provide sh shade, absorb heat, they produce a cooling effect and they also are playing an important role to obstruct and filter and defect, deflect the wind. Okay, so this reduces the wind chill, all right? And they also filter a lot of particles that come in the wind they will intercept and trap uh, particulates. As I told, particulates, uh, particulate matter is very important air pollutant. So they may uh, trap these uh, particulate matter, all right? And also they may absorb toxic gases and air pollutant. So this is, uh, by, these, by this way, the forest perform a regulative function. So what happens when there is deforestation, there is soil erosion, because of soil erosion, uh, I mean, solely the soil erosion will lead to uh, infertile soil, uh, a non-cultivable soil, and then uh, there is expansion of deserts and uh, there is a uh, altered precipitation pattern in the beginning and then there is decrease in rainfall the loss of fertile land and ultimately it affects the climate it leads to a uh, global climate change and it reduces the uh, water table because you know whenever forests are there then the rainwater it slowly is transferred to the ground and it enters the water table and it is stored there but when we when we de uh, when uh, deforestation is performed this water table gets depleted, there is no source. And uh, uh, deforestation also causes a loss of biodiversity because many species, 
uh, depend on these trees and plants. Okay, so uh, mining is not part of, uh, sorry, because of mining, again, uh, there's loss, uh, loss of forest cover because of uh, building of dams, forests are lost. So these are all uh, reasons for loss of forest cover. And uh, since they are important for the life and uh, as a source of, uh, as a resource, we have to uh, uh, you know, consider them as important and maintain the forests. Water as a resource, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, water is present everywhere. About 70% of the earth is covered with water, but usable form of water is only 3%. 3% only is fresh water. And in this 3%, 2% is present in polar ice caps. Again, cannot be used. And 1% is what we use is present in the rivers, lakes, and aquifers in the groundwater. Okay. So out of this 1%, we are using 70% for agriculture, 25% for the industry, and 5% for domestic use. The problem is that we are overutilizing and polluting water. Uh, as you can see in, uh, in our houses itself, we are overusing, uh, overutilizing water. You're not uh, using the required amount. Uh, a lot of water goes as a waste. In agriculture also, a lot of waste is there. Wastage of water is there. And, uh, you know, uh, it gets polluted by chemicals and industrial effluents. So this is, this is the damage and overutilization that we do. Uh, so we need to take care. The next uh, renewable resource is solar energy. All right. So we can make use of this solar energy because it has been found that, uh, that this can be used used to generate electricity and uh, generate heat so for day and this can be very well made use of so there are a lot of solar technologies that have been developed first one is a passive solar heating technology all right so here uh, we can uh, you know government and uh, organization they recommended to uh, use this technology to build houses that are designed to capture solar energy this may be useful in very cold countries cold places all right so houses are constructed in such a way that uh, sunlight enters the house um, in a proper way and it is uh, enters to the maximum time so that the house gets heated and the uh, you know the material on which the house is built also has the ability to capture that heat store that heat and uh, you know release that heat slowly so that the house is kept warm so this is passive solar heating then we have active solar hot water systems that uh, the technology can be used this is what we have been using in most of our houses we have that, uh, we call it as a solar heater. It is placed on top of our houses. You have that, uh, it is comprises of a solar flat plate collector. All right, so this is the plate collector, the uh, one that is kept at an angle where the sunlight hits the maximum. All right, so this is a comprises of a you know, glass uh, frame on the top, which allows uh, light to come inside. And on the inside, it is a black colored paint that absorbs heat, it gets heated. And through that, uh, the water is circulated in pipes so that the water gets heated. And then it comes to a storage tank where, the, where that heated water heats up, uh, you know, the water that is present in the tank. That tank is super insulated so that it holds the heat and the hot water. And that hot water can be supplied for, uh, you know, bath and washing utensils, etc. So these are solar flat plate collectors. And the second technology using solar energy. Third one, we can generate uh, electricity using solar energy. All right. So here we need to use the photovoltaic cell. In short, PV cell, photovoltaic cell. The principle behind working on the cell is that it is the cell is made up of, uh, uh, you know, wafer of uh, silicon. One side it has got borosilicate, and the other side has got phosphorus and silicon. And uh, when it is heated, or when uh, light strikes this uh, wafer, silicon wafer, em uh, electrons are emitted. Okay, so these electrons are components of electricity. So electricity can be generated. Okay, from this photovoltaic cell. Then the fourth technology using solar energy is the solar thermal electric, wherein you can heat water with sunlight to generate steam. All right, so we can use same as the uh, similar to the, the uh, you know the uh, uh, active solar hot water systems. Here we are heating water, generating steam, and using the steam to turn turbine, which can generate electricity. All right, so this is the technology solar thermal electric. Then the next uh, source of uh, uh, you know, uh, renewable resource is wind, alternate resource is wind. So we can tap wind to generate electricity. We, we know about the windmills. We can use this electricity or the wind to pump water because the, uh, you know, the uh, wind, wind energy is converted into mechanical or electric energy using different gadgets. Then another renewable resource is biomass. 
uh, biomass refers to organic matter anything that is living all right here we refer that to the plants organic matter that is present in plants and biological wastes which are generated from home and industry all right it comes from wood wood residues crop crop residues anything that we consider as waste can be used for fueling all right manure can be used urban waste industrial waste sewage components of sewage can also be used to generate energy okay so these products uh, like wood and uh, crop residues can be burnt directly or some of the products can be converted to form methane or ethanol which can be used as fuel all right so you can see that wood supplies 20% of the world's energy and there is a plant which is non edible called as euphorbia lathyris it's called as commonly called as a desert shrub which produces a oily substance and this oily substance can be refined to make fuel liquid fuel okay and uh, we know that uh, you know biogas production also you know using manure and they're kept in vats and uh, it slowly decomposes to give methane and this methane gas can be used as a fuel geothermal energy is another renewable resource all right so geothermal refers to geo refers to earth and thermal refers to heat so the heat that is present beneath the earth okay so the heat is present because there is a component called as magna in the earth's crust which is molten rock all right which produces a lot of heat and, and it also heats up the water that is present uh, in the earth's crust okay so the water table in that area gets heated up okay and this magna is constantly generated okay and uh, this can be uh, used for production of steam okay and uh, you know in in, uh, in in this particular technology called hydrothermal convection zone so there the uh, I, as i told you the magna heats the rock and the ground water okay and the heat drives the ground water to earth surface through fissures so wherever there's a fissure the boiling water is driven through that fissure to the earth surface okay it comes with very uh, you know high force all right so when it comes as a liquid it is called as a hot spring but if the water is so heated up that it comes as a, comes out as a steam it is called as a geyser all right so these uh, uh, liquid hot spring and steam geysers can be used uh, you know efficiently used to heat different systems and also the steam can be used to run turbines and this can be used to generate electricity other renewable sources are biodiesel which can be made from a different assortment of different oils vegetable oils hydrogen is becoming a important source renewable resource uh, hydrogen can be produced by heating water to very high temperatures or by passing electricity through water in the presence of a catalyst okay so hydrogen is produ produced and this hydrogen can be used as a um, as a fuel Uh, we are not going to talk about uh, non uh, non renewable resources because it is not there in the syllabus but then just for your uh, information oil and natural gas are the non uh, renewable resources coal is a non renewable resource so coal oil natural gas are the non renewable resources also called as fossil fuels because uh, they are got from fossils right so fossils are uh, those organisms life that has existed billions of years ago and they are buried in the deep under the earth surface in uh, you know oceans and they are converted into uh, you know fuel oil and natural gas uh, coming to nuclear energy uh, uh, you know um, atom which forms which is the uh, basic form of matter it is composed of uh, three parts okay so in the center we have the nucleus which comprises of the proton and the neutron proton and the neutron the proton is a positively charged particle a neutron is a neutrally charged particle you can see the plus here the blue colored one and the orange colored one and then around that nucleus we have a, a group of uh, uh, you know electrons which are negatively charged we call it as a cloud electron cloud all right so this is the structure of an atom all right now uh, the when there is a difference uh, you know uh, two atoms can be similar but then uh, can have the same number of uh, uh, protons or neutrons but sometimes uh, two atoms may differ in the number of neutrons that are present okay so when there is a difference in the number of neutrons within atoms between atoms then they are called as isotopes and these isotopes are important because they are uh, radioactive they will em emit radioactivity all right and they can be used in the production of energy okay so radioactivity is the process by which unstable nuclei of atoms they shoot out uh, chunks of mass and energy okay so the different types of radio radioactivity that we see is that alpha 
beta and gamma okay we either get alpha radiation or beta radiation or gamma radiation uh, gamma being the very strong one all right uh, so <clears throat> a nuclear change in which nuclei of certain isotopes with large mass numbers are split apart into lighter nuclei when struck by neutrons is called as a process called nuclear fission so as you can see here you can see an uh, you know uh, an isotope which is uranium 235 to uh, 235 Uh, is the um, total number of the total of the protons and neutrons that are present here so this is a radioisotope because another form of uranium is also present u uh, u uh, u234 so u35 is the isotope and when it is bombarded by uh, 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 by a, uh, a neutron then it splits okay when it splits it liberates energy okay so uh, this is how uh, this is the principle behind nuclear fission and this nuclear fission can be used to generate energy okay and uh, this is the setup of a nuclear fission reactor wherein we have the fuel rods over here this is the place where fuel rods are present inside the fuel rods the uranium or the isotope is kept all right and whenever the isotope is kept it interacts gets bombarded by uh, you know neutrons and then heat is produced okay and this heat uh, um, you know is transferred uh, transferred into uh, transport to the water that circulates around the fuel rods okay and uh, from there the heat uh, the uh, hot water enters another chamber where it heats up another uh, you know water body the water that is kept in that chamber and it generates heat and this steam that is generated from there can be used to turn the turbine thereby producing electricity and this water is condensed again i mean the steam is condensed again to form water and it is circulated back to get reheated so this is what happens in a nuclear reactor and usually these nuclear reactors are established near water uh, you know uh, uh, near water bodies so that you know the cooling uh, problem is solved coming to the next topic on natural hazards a natural hazard can be defined as an extreme event extreme event uh, that occurs naturally and causes harm to humans livestock and property so this is the simplest uh, definition of a natural hazard and extreme event that occurs naturally a natural hazard can become a natural disaster when an extreme event cost harm in significant amounts and overruns the cap capability of people to cope and respond so when it becomes a natural hazard it difficult it becomes difficult to manage natural hazards are classified into different types geological hydrological meteorological and biological we will see them in short in brief geological hazards refer to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions something that has to do with the geology or the earth okay so earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are called as geological hazards meteorological hazards refers to hazards that are driven by weather conditions like temperature and wind okay so heat wave cold wave cyclones and hurricanes are all meteorological hazards hydrological hazards are floods drought mudslides landslides and tsunamis okay and the biological hazards are caused by infectious diseases all right and uh, right now we are experiencing a biological hazard which is the pandemic caused by the corona viral disease 19 covid 19 corona viral disease 19 uh, how do we mitigate these natural hazards that means how do we uh you know um bring down the seriousness of the effect of uh, these hazards there are different uh, strategies in india there is the national disaster management authority which gives directives which trains individuals equips and uh, you know capacity building is done to manage these kind of disasters uh, so uh, it recommends that the buildings should be built uh, in a way that it is disaster resistant all right so especially seismic resistance in building design seismic resistance means it is resistant to uh, earthquakes all right so this can be done by incorporating shear walls okay uh, where in the in the walls there is a structural member there is a structure which uh, resists the lateral forces so the building does not sway and also use of braced frames a support in the frame okay so that uh, the uh, you know building does not sway uh, movement resistant frames diaphragms these are all different devices that are used to Uh, make the building strong so that it is not affected by the uh, the vibrations of the earthquake and also training uh, people how to live safe and also how to get out of the building uh, 
quickly and safely how to recognize that there is a natural hazard that's happening and how to uh, come out of the building so th these are the uh, you know uh, uh, functions of the ndma national disaster management authority okay recommendation of uh, seismic resistant building and training personnel uh, to mitigate cyclones the strategy is to maintain the scan which stand uh, you know strong wind because i you know the wind moves at several hundreds of kilometers this okay so as you can see there's a brace brace means a support like this okay uh, braces of the uh, roof can impact having impact resistance windows and doors also having early warning systems so when there's a circle cyclone it should be uh, you know um, uh, the alert should be given early all right for which we have to have systems which recognize that the cyclone is developing and then announcement should be made early early warning systems all weather road links so there should be a road which uh, is uh, functional in any kind of a weather it should not be inundated it should not be blocked because of weather conditions so that this road will connect to many habitats and it will help in clearing people and also you know maintaining the drains okay making it clear and maintaining them so that when there is a flood or a cyclone the drains will carry the excess water and it will not cause flooding floods also can be uh, managed you know the way we can manage flood is to have a building structure as you can see here in this uh, picture an elevated uh, you know foundation the building is uh, above the flooding level of the ground or right? and we can have the flood wall you know kind of a compound wall called a flood wall which is reinforced which is strong and anchored to withstand the flood load and also have you can have the uh, uh, you know uh, flood walls and embankments along rivers which prevents the flow of water into towns and cities okay and also the natural detention basins as i told you the encroachment should not be there if we can leave these natural detention basins then the flood will uh, flood water will get collected in those natural basins okay so we need to maintain those natural detention basins again we can have a forecast early warning systems and all that coming to the different laws for environmental protection um, i will skip all this because i'll go directly into what is required the environment protection act is being asked as part of the syllabus so this act was uh, uh, brought into force as early as 1986 of course the government of india has been uh, you know taking measures to protect the environment since the year 1935 Uh, but in 1970s and 80s there was a lot of concern uh, global concern uh, so you know, the act was uh, enforced in 1986 so under this act the central government has the power to take all measures uh, for the purpose of protecting and improving the quality of environment so under this law it has a lot of power so it can uh, you know um, uh, uh, designate safe limits and it can lay standards for emission or discharge of environmental pollutions restrict the areas where industry can be built or operate uh, and it can impose regulations for handling of hazardous substances prevention of accidents it can it has given guidelines and see and oversees whether these guidelines are being followed and uh, this uh, this act you know has the uh, has all these provisions national action plan on climate change uh, this was uh, uh, you know um, uh, brought into force or uh, came into existence existence in the year 2008 on june 30th this was uh, this was a long uh, you know uh, uh, pending dream of uh, the indian government and this was uh, developed to this uh, comprises of eight missions and it was developed to mitigate uh, and adapt to climate change all right so under that there are eight missions the first one is national solar mission where it uh, you know um, uh, aims to establish solar research center it has been established already it is in haryana solar research center then increased uh, international collaboration for the use of solar energy and technology the second mission was uh, a national mission for enhanced energy efficiency where it recommends the mandating specific energy consumption uh, decrease in the energy consumption use of uh, you know energy um, efficient uh, uh, gadgets and also uh, you know provision of incentive for effective use of energy you know the less of tax and all that third mission was national mission on sustainable habitat uh, uh, under this mission it aims to promote energy efficiency as a core component of urban planning so bring in 
sustainable planning in urban uh, development all right and uh, fourth mission was national water mission the goal was to uh, you know uh, improve uh, water use efficiency all right by uh, imposing price on water consumption and other measures so that the uh, population will use the water wisely fifth mission was national mission for sustaining himalayan ecosystem here the goal was to prevent the melting of the himalayan glaciers and also protect biodiversity in the himalayan region then the sixth one was green india mission uh, under this mission a forest station was planned 6 million hectares of forest land uh, which was uh, you know degraded was uh, again you know uh, uh, you know plant these trees are planted and uh, by this uh, uh, you know the country wants to improve the forest cover from 23 to 33% then the seventh mission national mission for sustainable agriculture to support climate adaptation in agriculture eighth mission national mission on strategic knowledge for climate change so here to establish centers which can research on climate change uh, have a better understanding on climate change and its impact so that was the eighth mission so eight missions under the national action plan on climate change in short napcc Uh, international environmental agreements uh, some of the important international environmental agreements are these montreal protocol uh, so this uh, was uh, agreed or signed in the year 1987 so a protocol uh, is a legally binding document which comes under a treaty so whenever there is a convention or treaty then there is a uh, you know an adjunct to that uh, montreal uh, the uh, treaty it's called as a protocol it's a legally binding document so here the countries which are members to this uh, treaty have agreed to protect the ozone layer so this was mainly brought into force to protect ozone layer because in at that time they recognized the importance of ozone okay so they agreed to phase out the production and consumption of ozone depleting substances ods in short okay so it was agreed on 16 september 1987 and entered into force on 1st january 89 so because of the uh, imposition of this particular protocol and agreement between different countries between 18, 1987 and 2014 there was successful elimination of over 98% of ozone depleting substances all right and uh, from 89 to 2013 it was recorded that uh, you know cumulative carbon dioxide emissions were brought down okay 135 billion tons was brought down okay this was very significant so it was a very effective protocol so a protocol talks about protecting the ozone layer united nations conference on environment and development so this conference popularly called as earth summit it happened in rio de janeiro in brazil okay also called as rio summit so here it was convened the summit was convened to reconcile worldwide economic development uh, with a view to protect the environment so this is one of the major summits where a lot of talks about environmental protection happened so this happened from 3rd to 14th june 1992 all right so in, during this uh, conference the united nations framework convention on climate change unfccc an international environmental treaty was also negotiated so these are all very important uh, to tackle environmental issues the convention on biological diversity so uh, when this uh, when this conference happened uh, uh, the earth summit happened as part of that the convention on biological diversity also happened so it's a multilateral treaty many uh, uh, parties are there to this treaty many uh, countries have agreed with the three main goals conserve biodiversity and to use the biodiversity the sustainable use of uh, biodiversity and its components and fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from genetic resources so these were the points that were greatly agreed upon uh, under this uh, convention so the key document uh, regarding sustainable development was opened for signature that means it Uh, everything was agreed upon and the parties were asked to sign during the earth summit on 5th june okay and it entered into force on 29th december 1993 all right so along with this uh, cbd the supplementary agreements were the uh, protocol uh, the cartagena protocol on biosafety which talks about uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, the wise use of uh, genetically engineered organisms and how safely we can use it bio safety because there's a uh, there might be some hazardous organisms which might escape during uh, transport or transfer from one country to another or while working in a lab so it uh, formed the guidelines for that okay so it was called as cartagena protocol on bio safety and the nagoya protocol which uh, which was a 
a protocol uh, agreement or a document to assess the genetic resources okay genetic resources for example seed is a genetic resource it contains genetic material and it can be preserved and uh, distributed to a different uh, consumer so access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization so this was agreed upon during the nagoya in the nagoya protocol okay so these are all important uh, protocols where a lot of agreements uh, were carried out the kyoto protocol was uh, convened uh, uh, under the 1992 united nations framework convention on climate change all right uh, so it commits the state parties to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so this protocol Uh, specifically aims at or concentrates or focuses on reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and makes the countries agree upon processes that you know uh, produce a lot of greenhouse gases to limit and bring down the use of greenhouse gases all right so this was adopted in kyoto in japan that's why it's called as kyoto protocol uh, on 11th december 1997 paris agreement um, otherwise called as conference of parties 21 all right other way and also called as paris climate conference this happened on 12th december 2015 so this is a landmark agreements that came under this agreement uh, this particular conference conference of parties was to combat climate change to accelerate and intensify the actions and investments needed for sustainable low carbon future so this is a kind of a annual uh, or a regular uh, conference that uh, uh, reviews and takes measures based on the unf uh, unfccc uh then the international solar alliance this is uh, very important for india because the prime minister of india uh, was one of the major uh, uh, members who proposed this so president of france and the prime minister of india uh, launched uh, this particular international solar solar alliance at the un climate change conference held in paris in 2015 so this is a common platform for cooperation among the countries to uh, you know uh, use solar energy efficiently use solar energy okay so it includes 80 countries focus areas to promote solar technologies new building you know business models and investment in solar sector formulate projects programs to promote solar applications facilitate capacity building for promotion and absorption of solar technologies and research and development among member countries okay so for those who don't know what capacity building is because we have some students uh, capacity building means training the personnel to be equipped to work on this particular area so that is capacity build moving on to the last part uh, millennium development goals uh, so the 191 uh, members of the united nations they agreed to achieve eight goals you know in 2002 in the year 2000 they gathered together and they agreed to achieve eight goals in 2015 in 15 years okay um, <coughs> and uh, this happened during the united nations millennium declaration in september 2000 okay so the eight goals were to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger to achieve universal primary education to promote gender equality and empower women to reduce child mortality to improve maternal health to combat diseases like aids malaria to ensure environmental sustainability to develop a global partnership for development so these were the eight goals and all the activities and programs of the different countries which agreed 191 countries or parties that agreed to all this had to uh, adhere and conduct different programs which uh, which were uh, you know directed towards achieving these goals okay so there were specific targets and indicators to achieve the uh, millennium development goals there were dates in which they had to achieve um sustainable development goals so in the recent years we are hearing a lot about this Uh, so this is again uh, an agenda by the united nations okay so they again um, gathered and adopted this particular uh, uh, agreement in 2015 so they agreed that by 2030 2030 uh, we have to attain these sustainable development goals okay so it provides a shared blueprint a framework for peace and proper prosperity for the people and the planet right uh, so an urgent call for action by all countries it was an urgent call Uh, both developing and develop, uh, developed countries to enter into a global partnership and to achieve these goals okay so there are 17 sustainable development goals as you can see here no poverty no hunger good health and well being quality education gender equality clean water and sanitation affordable and clean energy decent work and economic growth industry innovation and infrastructure reduced inequalities 
sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, partnership for the goals. So as you can see, there are part of the goals are, uh, you know, goals towards uh, improving our uh, standards. Okay. So development, all that is there. But at the same time, certain goals um, specify how we need to, uh, you know, grow while taking care of uh, many important issues. Okay. So it becomes sustainable. So these are the 17 sustainable goals. So with that, uh, uh, I want to end. So thank you for your patient uh, listening. I hope it was useful and I wish each participant the very best and uh, come out with flying colors in the upcoming net examinations. Thank you, Jude, sir. Thanks a lot for this elaborate session on people and environment. I'm very sure that uh, even the participants who are from non-science background are now aware of many uh, topics related to science and the environment and they got some awareness of this. Okay, uh, uh, participants, I request you to post the questions or you can even uh, discuss with sir. Anybody has any questions, please raise your hand or you can put the question on the chat. Uh, someone has asked, could you share the syllabus? Uh, I think uh, at the end, they will be sharing the syllabus, right, to Sonia, ma'am? Uh, yes, sir, we will do that. We will do that. Okay. I hope the internet connectivity was uh, perfect and uh, there was no interruption in between. Uh, uh, I could hear, sir, some participants were messaging saying that uh, uh, the voice is a little dragging, but I told them that it was clear from our side. Okay, okay. It looks like uh, nobody's having any questions. Participants, a few more minutes. Any questions? Okay. Uh, okay. Sir, Dr. Vidya has asked, will the questions be direct or indirect? Oh, uh, indirect also, I have seen many questions coming indirect. So you should be prepared. So that is why I dealt with this session a little elaborate, I think. Uh, because if I have uh, direct, I mean, uh, uh, planned this session in a direct way, then we would, we would not have seen uh, uh, the larger perspective. Uh, so that is why I planned uh, an elaborate uh, discussion here. I hope uh, um, many things are covered, uh, but still I, I would recommend and uh, request uh, all of you uh, to read more uh, you know, um, uh, recent uh, news and uh, articles on the recent events, environmental issues and events. Uh, the questions, uh, uh, we are going to have a mock test. Uh, isn't it Sonia ma'am? So someone has asked, will you uh, send some questions related to these topics? Of course, yes. uh, we will we will create a question bank and we can send. Uh, what do you say, Sonia, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll work on it, sir. And the mock test also, they will be seeing questions related to all the topics in paper one. Yes, yes. Okay, so if there are no further previous year's questions, will be more helpful, sir. Uh, uh, we cannot say. I don't think they are, uh, you know, they are, uh, they will definitely avoid the previous year's question, I guess. Because I think only few questions are coming in this, uh, uh, you know, portion. And they have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, content. So the questions, they have a lot of choice to uh, select the questions. So I don't think the previous year's question, immediate previous year question may come. Uh, any other reference, I would suggest that, uh, uh, you know, any environmental science book, environmental science book uh, by a good author uh, uh, can be referred to. 
in your library in your college or institution library if you have a book on book uh, titled environmental science authored by daniel daniel kiras t h i r a s is one of the good books that i usually refer uh new topics included this year i think last year they included uh, new topics uh, uh, that is the uh, uh, environmental laws and uh, environmental hazards uh, and the uh, developmental goals millennium development goals and uh, sustainable development goals were the new ones that were introduced last year i don't think this year there's any change isn't it uh, sonia ma'am oh uh, yes sir it looked the same sir not not much change okay <coughs> okay so if there are no further questions uh, we will uh, wind up with the session the first session for today day 2 uh, so thank you sir from our side thank you very much for the time and for the all the wonderful like, current affairs is also important that's what uh, vidya ma'am is messaging. current current affairs uh, pertaining to environmental <laughs> issues ma'am uh, current affairs pertaining to environmental issues with regard to this uh, for portion you have to be aware ma'am you can i i i presume that you can expect a question from the uh, current pandemic okay covid so you be familiar with covid what is covid uh, sars uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome sars uh, corona virus 2 is the virus that is causing the pandemic now sars cov 2 sars corona virus 2 Okay. Yeah. So thank you, Jude sir. Thank you for your time and your wonderful presentation. Uh, it is really informative and very useful uh, topics that you had covered. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. All the best. So participants kindly rejoin at four o'clock for the next session, and please be on time. Thank you. Amir sir i think we can end the meeting thank you sir